Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Up Close. Stories, objects, and ideas from beyond the galleries. This is the Royal Alberta Museum virtual talk series. My name is Eleonora Sermoneta, and I'm the adult learning programmer here at RAM, and I will be your host during this talk. So before we start, I wanted to take this opportunity to share that I'm connecting from Amiskwachi Waskaigan. Amiskwachi Waskaigan is the Cree name of Edmonton. And the land upon which I stand is Treaty 6 territory. This is the traditional territory of the Cree and Nakoda peoples and the homeland to the Métis. This is the gathering place of generations of Dene, Blackfoot, Sutina, Soto, and the Inuit people. And I want to honor and celebrate the cultures, languages, <clears throat> and histories of indigenous peoples of this land. I also want to remind you that June is Indigenous History Month here in Canada. And uh, I would like to invite you to learn more, appreciate, and experience the rich and diverse cultures of indigenous peoples of this land. Um, all right, so during this uh, talk session, we will have a presentation by an expert followed by a Q&A session. So this is a little bit of a, a you know, housekeeping moment. Um, if you have any questions, please type them uh, in the chat or use the Q&A feature. And uh, I will be uh, monitoring both the chat and the Q&A, so we make sure that we're not skipping any of your questions. Um, today's talk is called the Ancient Buffalo Hunting on the Great Plains, and I'm really excited about this talk. So we have a slight change of plan. I know that uh, you folks were expecting Conrad Little Leaf. Unfortunately, Conrad cannot be uh, here with us today, but fear not, we have an excellent plan B. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our new special guest and speaker, Stan Knowlton, as well as Quinton Crowshoe, and of course, Conrad Little Leaf, from Head Smash Dean Buffalo Jump Award Heritage Site for working with the Royal Alberta Museum and participating in an up close. So this talk could have never happened without you. So thank you very much. I also wanted to provide a quick introduction for our special guest, Stan Knowlton. Stan is a member of the Picani Nation, one of the four nations that make up the uh, Blackfoot Confederacy. And Stan has a Bachelor of Science in Geography with a focus uh, on archaeology and a concentration on GIS from the University of Lethbridge. He's currently the Head of Interpretation at Ed Smash Team Buffalo Jump, and he has been there for over 16 years. So thank you, Stan, for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. I really appreciate this. And I'll be passing the microphone to you. So feel free to start whenever you're ready. I'll be here in uh, the background, you know, lurking and monitoring the chat. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so all the way from down in Montana up to uh, an area west of Edmonton known as Rocky Mountain House. Those were the uh, areas that uh, the ancient ones, the old people, you know, used to travel. And uh, for thousands of years, uh, they were able to collect information of the land and also share uh, those parts of their culture, you know, with the people that were around them. So out to the east of us were what was known as Sankita, the prairie people. And once a year, they would gather at the uh, Great Sundance, and they would exchange uh, parts of the culture as well as uh, ceremonial and storytelling. So that's what uh, we have here today is uh, one of the the moments that we are able to uh, look at what uh, creates and preserves those stories of the connections between the uh, Prairie Bison people and their culture uh, with the land and uh, also with you know, a lot of the uh, place names that uh, we sometimes uh, forget to acknowledge. So that's what we're going to be looking at today is uh, how do we um, uh, take those uh, events and stories that were told in the past and you know 
you know, in a in a new version of the method of this this method is to you know look at it from a remote sensing perspective, not so much in place, but also in time. And then from there, those stories will translate down to who we are today. And it also provides us, you know, with a journey, a roadmap into the journey that uh, we are taking. So the story starts out a long time ago, over 200 million years ago. The grandfathers of the buffalo roamed the earth and uh, they left behind a certain footprints or fingerprints, you know, that they were here. So inside what is known as a vaculite uh, is something that eventually comes out as we uh, initially uh, always start our ceremonies with uh, something called a vaculite. So here in my hand, we have what's known as an iniscum, you know, which is derived from the vaculite. So at the beginning of our, our story, and at the beginning of the buffalo hunt, you know, the uh, invocation of the, um, the, iniscum, the iniscum ceremony was a reminder and an acknowledgement of the buffalo, like you see behind me. Bill. So the uh, stories that we have, you know, come from the land, they, they come from the people, and they also come from the ceremonies, the stories, the songs, the dances, and they are, are all interconnected and they become a living thing. And we are able to partake in those uh, story, stories as uh, almost bringing them, you know, back to life. So every time we tell the story, we add a little life to it and it brings a little bit of life to us as well. So the, uh, the story of Hit Smashed in Buffalo Jump comes to us from four uh, distinct perspectives. Uh, the first one, which if you visit our center here, begins on a main level, and it's the story created by the science of archeology. span So we do have an archeology span dig going on right now, and they eventually go down through the different layers in order to create uh, a series of connecting uh, you know, be, being able to connect the different levels into a story that we're able to see and hear, and in some cases, to even to be able to touch. Uh, the uh, second level uh, comes to us from what we refer to as the cultures in contact. So these are stories of people, early explorers that came into this area, not really understanding what they were seeing, you know, looking around, observing, looking at what is known as a bison, Mm, you know, I'm not too sure what it is. And all of a sudden, the name Buffalo, you know, gets attached to it. In our language, you know, we simply refer to it as Enil. So from the third level all the way to the top of the building, we look at what's known as the, uh, the oral tradition of the uh, Blackfoot people and the Plains Prairie Buffalo culture. But then once we get to the very top of the building, we're able to look around at uh, 3,600 feet from up at the very top, across the Great Plains to the east, to the mountains to the west of us. And, you know, from the land, if you're able to understand the language, the place names, you know, where stories occurred and were carried down through generations, then we're able to get a much broader in-depth understanding, you know, of who we are today. And that's the most important thing is being able to take all those perspectives, keeping an open mind, you know, and being able to bring them together. I know today in our modern language, everything moves very fast. Uh, things tend to change. So a lot of times, you know, we have to find a nice quiet place and be able to listen deep inside and in there, you know, we can often hear the distant voices of our elders, you know, passing down this information to us. So the story of Hit Smashed in Buffalo Jump is told uh, by the name of its location, which we would refer to as uh, Napi Neek uh, or Napi 
what we refer to as uh, this area being Dumipiskan uh, or Ninapiskan. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also known as the first jump of Napi. It, uh, and that's where the, the name originally comes from, which is a big long word. Is to box skin scoots it's a bus stand make a scoot. But today, um, you know, we simply translate that into head smashed in buffalo jump. And it was not the buffalo that came over the cliff and had their head smashed in. It was the story of a young boy who wouldn't listen. And even though he was told not to go up during the, the hunt, he disregarded that and he decided to go up there. And in the process, you know, he paid the ultimate price. So as they were, as the buffalo came over the cliff, nobody really knows what happened. But, you know, when the people came up to start removing the carcasses and processing the buffalo, they removed an animal. They found him there. They found this young boy there with his head smashed in. So in a, you know, in a, in a sense, this story was meant you know, to convey the message in a deeper way, that was a very dangerous place to be during the hunt. If you were lucky, you went up, you had one try, and um, under 75 animals, it's very doubtful, you know, if uh, the jump would work. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, contract that they had, you know, with the Aniscom, uh, they were limited to the numbers of uh, buffalo that they would be allowed to take. So in this particular case, if everything worked out, you would have one leader, which was uh, the grandmother buffalo, and she would take her small group of about 300 animals, move them up into the hills, and then at that point, you know, was where uh, the story of head smashed in buffalo jump would begin. But the story goes back much farther. If we go back to the last ice age, you know, we, um, we do have, uh, you know, stories that talk about the importance of how uh, the landscape was changing. So if anybody has ever been up to the uh, Jasper ice fields up uh, around the uh, Jasper area, Banff, Jasper area, you'll come to the big, uh, the great Columbia ice fields and they do have an interpretive center up there. And they got this big glacier that's, you know, retreating back into the mountains. And one of the things that uh, very noticeable is uh, how all this uh, sediment and water and silt and gravel, you know, begins to come out from underneath the glacier as the glacier is retreating back. So this area here that we're in uh, was actually covered, you know, by uh, glaciation many years ago, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, 20,000 years ago. And it, uh, the front of the glacier moved all the way down to about the 49th parallel. Uh, and, you know, if you ever drive down from Fort McLeod uh, down to Great Falls, you know, once you cross the 49th parallel, you could actually see the terrain sort of dip down. Uh, as you're going towards the Great Falls area. And when you look around, you could see that almost a big bathtub ring that was left behind, you know, by that, uh, by that particular time, uh, you know, going back in our history. Now, one of the, the things that we also have to consider is that from that point where the glaciers are retreating, the same thing would happen as what's happening today, is that you have all this material coming out and water from underneath the glaciers. And the first buffalo that are coming back up into this area, you know, would be to depositing uh, something like this, which uh, we would simply refer to as a buffalo chip. So this is uh, sort of like a micro environment here. You have uh, seeds, you have moisture, you have nutrients in here. And the big things that you have about maybe anywhere from 20 to 80 million buffalo, you know, they're pushing in, they go back. And each time they bring in, each time they come forward, they're depositing, you know, maybe 10 of these uh, items on a prairie every day. 
So you can imagine 80 million buffalo 10 times a day, that's a huge amount of um, material that's coming in. So not to mention, you know, the uh, fertilization of the prairies taking place, the transformation, you know, from a glacial landscape to a mature prairie environment. But also you have birds coming in, uh, you know, they're also depositing their material. You have buffalo dying and being born by the millions. So the, uh, the transition from glacial, you know, to prairie, you know, is often forgotten and forgotten as a very significant event, you know, which today, you know, we continue to benefit from. Uh, without the buffalo having been here, very simple, we wouldn't be here. And, you know, you look at how that has contributed to our modern societies. We have ranching, we have farming, and a lot of it goes directly back, you know, to the buffalo having deposited, you know, all this valuable nutrients, you know, to that landscape. And, you know, it's not very deep, but you go down a few inches and um, now you're into, you know, the ancient glacial tills, uh, you know, that once um, were right at the top of this level. So that's what the archaeologists are doing. They're looking at those different uh, strata and then they're interpreting, you know, what that landscape looks like. So one of the surprising things that we just found out, you know, from some of the notes of the early, ex early uh, excavators, archaeologists that were doing work in the area, was at one point there was a, you know, an individual that located some ancient items that uh, were described as being um, a, a camel, part of a camel, camel bones. There was also miniature horses, mammoth, saber-toothed tiger. And, uh, you know, there might be other things that have, uh, that are yet to be confirmed. But, you know, it does tell us, you know, the place uh, was uh, very much alive during those glacial times. Now, one of the other things that, uh, you know, what, what we're looking at is that, you know, over time, uh, people move in into this area and they're also, you know, looking and observing everything that they see. So they begin to put their own uh, culture, to, you know, they, they, they begin to almost connect with the land to produce the foundation of their culture. So that's where storytelling, you know, is very important and how it uh, comes in to, you know, be a part of um, what we understand today. So back in my community, we had a person, an elder by the name of uh, Percy Bullchild, and this is one of his books, uh, The Sun Came Down. And a lot of people read this, and it is hard to understand because it's written, it's published in English. But I remember as a young person, Percy would bring the elders over to my grandparents' place. They would tell stories, exchange stories, and Sometimes it didn't always go as smooth as, you know, you might expect. But the way uh, the uh, chief described it to me was that he said it's like grass. And, uh, you know, when you, if you look at a grass, it has a stem that comes up and then the leaves all spread out in different directions. And storytelling, what it's meant to do is to track back to the stem and to take that story back down, you know, below the surface and into the roots. Into the roots, you know, everything comes together. And that's uh, what he tried to, tried to portray, that, uh, you know, some of the disagreements that the elders were having at the time wasn't so much that they, uh, you know, that it was uh, offensive to each other, but it was more or less making a journey back you know, to the, to the stem. And, you know, with these, uh, the uh, material that uh, Percy was able to collect, uh, it was a very good example of how, you know, they look towards the future and they say, okay, we're going to do this because they recognize stories and language, you know, we're being impacted. And this was the new medium that they would use in order to try and, you know, carry their messages forward. Well, today, you know, we have a video conference like we have today, and that in many ways 
serves, uh, you know, another, it serves the same purpose of what they were trying to achieve, to transfer that knowledge down to the young people. So the, uh, the two books that we have, uh, this one are uh, being written in English. If it's interpreted, if it's translated back into Blackfoot, into this original story form, makes a lot more sense. But in addition to that, if you look at the book here, which was called The American Indian Genesis, uh, it also, you know, takes those stories much farther back. And it also gives uh, context, you know, to some of the place names that we have around here. Uh, like I previously mentioned a little while ago, we have this river running beneath the uh, Buffalo Jump here that we refer to today as the Old Man River. And it, the name was, you know, recently changed. You go back far enough, and in my memory and my community, uh, we lived down by the river and we would refer to it as Napi Nidhta. And it was not a short Napi's river. Uh, the uh, river falling of fall farther down east actually flowed north of us and it was known as the Old Man River. And the Old Man and Napi create, you know, cause a lot of confusion uh, if you don't read the book. The book very clearly explains that Napi and the old man, you know, were two separate items. So during my journey in life, uh, my elders explained to me that the mountains along where we live here, 50 miles west of here, uh, refer to the backbone. And so you feel the back of your neck, there are some bumps in there. And that was the mountains going up. When you get up towards Banff, there's a place called Kananaskis. And in our language, we would say Kananatsis. So when we say, when we talk about Kananatsis, you know, it was something that a very important person, you know, would uh, don on their head. Now, once you get up towards Banff, you follow down what we call the Bow River. So here's the Bow River, a little bow here. We say Nama. And with that, you would also have a little town east of Calgary known as Arrowwood. So right here is where we would refer to as the Arrow. Now, back in Calgary, you have a very important river up there. We call it Mohkinstis. And Calgary today is still referred to as the Elbow. Behind us, we have the Porcupine Tail Hills, which forms the chest area here. Below the chest, right at the ribs, right here, you have a little drop, and it's exactly where the Buffalo Jump is located today. Down a little farther to the south, we have the stomach area, and today we call that the Belly River. Move down a little farther, you have Chief Mountain towards the mountains to the west. And as you go down to Missoula, Montana, you'll see the Blackfoot River slowly winds its way out from the mountains. So when you put all those uh, place names together, that was the old man. And there has to be a balance. So farther to the east, you have the old woman. The old woman has her body parts all marked out down there as well. And you go down to a little lake there. It's called Bukawi Lake today. In our language, we would say Pukaki. And Pukaki is something, when you translate it, was a tiny mother. So she must have been a, a small, small lady. Up towards Medicine Hat, coming this way towards the west, there's a town of seven persons. And those were the children. So those children, the oldest one is one we refer to as Napi. And the youngest guy, we referred to him as Ukina. So Ukina was the one who was gifted, you know, with the red paint here, as you can see here. And his, his origins, the stories, you going back, you know, to the Genesis, begin way to the south, southwest. And they say that he eventually moved up into this area here. But in addition to that, you know, it, give, it opens up the landscape, uh, you know, to a new 
or a different way of looking at it with the introduction of color. So farther down to the south, we have a place called Yellowstone and where they get the yellow paint. To the west of us, we have the Rocky Mountains, the Red Rock Canyon, and a little bit north of there is where they get the paint that we use and we see here. And to the north of us, if you ever go up to Edmonton, the white mud area, there you go, white mud, the white paint. To the east of us, we have what we call Saskatchewan. And in Blackwood, we would say Sasquinuts. It used to be where the tree line used to be. And right in the middle here, we have something called the city of Lethbridge, Sokokatoki. So Sokokatoki referred to the place of the black paint. So when you put it all together, you have yellow to the south, red to the west, white to the north, green to the east, and the middle, black. So those were other methods that they had, you know, for describing uh, what we refer to as a landscape of color. And in addition to that, dots were also considered a color. You know, whoever would have thought that. In addition to that, you have these little triangles going across. Those are also considered a color. Today we call them, you know, we refer to them as little geometric, uh, you know, designs or shapes. But back in the, you know, their day, it was color. And that, I always find that a little hard to wrap my mind around. But, you know, that's how things came to be. So once you uh, start to begin to connect, you know, the land, the place names, you know, with the, what we refer to as the beginnings of the buffalo culture, uh, how the land is created by the buffalo. And from there, you then get the stories of uh, the buffalo having disappeared and people are starving. Napi, you know, goes in search of the buffalo, comes across a teepee, a lodge. In there, there's some, uh, what we refer to as raven. And, uh, you know, they have transformed themselves into people. And in the process, they've rounded up all the buffalo and they've taken them up into the hills, Porcupine Hills, into a cave. And the people are starving. So now he's walking around with his friends, locates this teepee, he could smell meat cooking. So they go over there, transform themselves into a coyote and into a digging stick. And the digging stick is, you know, a very important thing. So here they're taken back to the lodge. From there, the, uh, they eat the buffalo meat in the middle of the night. So it forces the ravens to go up into the cave to retrieve a couple more animals. And in doing so, they take... Uh, you know, what was then becomes a dog up into the cave with the digging stick. And while in the cave, they retransform themselves back into Napi and his friend, the coyote. So from there, the buffalo are returned out onto the prairies. And, uh, you know, there was always this big um, story about how Napi would hang the, hung the, or hang the uh, raven up into the smoke hole up in a teepee and with all the smoke going up he made the he made these um what we refer to as the ravens promise never to take the buffalo again and in doing so uh the buffalo reluct or the uh, ravens are re reluctantly replied ah in our language that meant yes so when they you know with that agreement you know, the buffalo are returned. Now, in the process of doing that, uh, there's a young lady collecting wood. And uh, so she's given this uh, the aniscum, you know, with the understanding that they're only, uh, there's, it's like a contract that has been created. Okay, you take 300 animals, you do this, you do that. And before the hunt, you perform this. The service. So as long as they did that, the buffalo would always be here. So for thousands of years, you know, this is actually the symbol of the culture and the relationship between the people and uh, the buffalo. So during what I mentioned, 
the uh, herds would be selected. And what a lot of people don't realize is that buffalo don't just run like lemmings off a cliff. You know, it's, it's, it's a very a tedious, meticulous way of maneuvering them in order to get them down there. So myself, um, <laughs> I've been chased by buffalo three times. And the uh, first time, you, know, you learn something. Second time, uh, you learn a little bit more. And then third time, uh, you learn, get out of the way. Don't go there. <laughs> so there, there is, uh, you know, stories about how, you know, the buffalo were eventually maneuvered down into the drive lanes. And it wasn't just anybody that went up there. These people had to specialize. They had to be specialized and trained to do a job. And according to what we found here at the archaeology or at the from the archaeology survey around in here, I said we're able to locate where the teepee camp was. And by measuring it, we estimate maybe about 50 teepees were here, five, 10 people per teepee. So we're looking at maybe about three to five hundred people that would have taken, you know, to operate the buffalo hunt. So, and these uh, people weren't just anybody, you know, they were trained. So you can imagine if your survival depended on a successful hunt, you didn't want to have just anybody up here like me. You wanted the very best. And that's what they did. There was a training process that they went through. And, you know, they learned all about it before they were even allowed to go up here. Because you can imagine if you failed and if you... Um, you know, something didn't go the way it was supposed to, and the, six, the, the hunt was unsuccessful, you're going to have a very long, cold, and hungry winter that you might not survive. So you want to make sure you leave absolutely nothing to chance. And even though they had one set of drive lanes set up, they had about five, what we've counted, all the way to the Vision Quest Hill, in case this one here didn't work. But this one here was very special because of three items that were that were here. To the west of us, you got this huge area called the Gathering Basin. So that's where you're able to select the herd that you're gonna take. Too many big animals, you're not gonna have anything for clothing for your little people and the children. You got too many small animals, you're not gonna have anything for tool making and teepees. So you wanna have perfect balance. Once that's selected, now you're going to have to be able to find a way to get that lead animal, that grandmother buffalo, to start taking her group down the drive lanes. So first thing they would do is that you would have a, a calf hide, somebody with a calf hide on, and they're going to mimic a baby calf and start making their way down. The grandmother buffalo is going to be curious, find out what's going on, so she'll follow along. Uh, the rest of the herd is going to be cautiously observing what's going on. So now you have the wolf runners that are gonna move in behind, give them a little scare, give them a little push, and you keep things moving down towards the cliff. Now, once you get within uh, range of the, uh, the edge of the cliff, and then from that point, you still can't see the cliff. The way this place is set up, it's sort of a downhill, and there's a big drop, and then all of a sudden the prairie starts up. So from a certain point, the buffalo are gonna be looking out across the prairie and all they're gonna see is safety. So the escape route is over there. So they're moving cautiously down. The stampede is ignited and away they go. Once they reach maximum velocity, you know, that's, that's what you want. So at that point, the grandmother buffalo still can't see the cliff, but she is going to, you know, intuition. There's other senses that are kicking in. And she's going to feel something's wrong. She hits the brakes. Animals that are behind her are going to move up on the sides. Once that are on the side, are going to move up in front. And that creates a wall that prevents her from turning around. And it's going to take them twice the distance to stop. The ones are pushing from behind. And over they go. And that is probably the most dangerous time of the hunt. Because at the bottom, you have maybe 300 animals that are going to be down there. And you, know, they're, you don't know if they're all dead or not. You know, they're, some are going to survive. 
So the first bunch, you know, it's going to move in with these. So it's almost like hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're so close. So you got to imagine you're here and a buffalo's here. So we want to make sure you take that animal down. So they're going to, you know, they're going to be going there very fast and very aggressive. Now, on the other side, you'll have some animals that are moving around. Well, you don't know if they're going to get up. You don't know, you know, if it's going to be safe to, to move in. Because you could see if these things are, you know, they hit you with one of these things. It's like a small car running, running over you. No one, no 911 back in those days. You could be in big trouble. So you have to be very careful as well. So the next thing that you're going to have uh, is a spear. And with a spear, it's going to give you a longer, you know, there's a longer margin of safety involved. So you have the guys running in and they will have, oh, here we go. They will have an attachment on here so that, you know, once, once you fix it in with the uh, spear, you have the projectile point that will go in. It's pulled out. This part stays in. You reload. You put another one in. Look for a next moving buffalo. You hit them with, you know, with this. So you have a little bit longer distance. It's a little bit uh, wider margin of safety going on here. Now, at the other side, you would have an animal that all of a sudden is starting to get up. It's too dangerous to go in with this and with the malls. So you're going to need another tool. So something like this, which we refer to as an atlatl. The throwing, it's meant to whip that spear, which is a shorter than the regular spear. But this thing here would kick this thing and away this would go. So that gives you another level of safety, which involved with that. And of course, the final thing when you have a moving target, there's nothing more precise than a good bow. So bow is loaded in, you pull it back and then you let it go. So between these four tools, you know, is where you create, you transform that kill site into the beginnings of what we would refer to as the processing of the animal. And the entire area right now, you know, that's in front where the archaeologists are digging. They are going down you know, into that processing area. And what they're hoping to do is to penetrate, you know, into that bottom layer uh, that goes back beyond 6,000. Last year, they were very lucky. They found some items down. They're able to date them. And originally we thought, well, 5,700 years ago. But now from the research and the excavation from last year, we've been able to push that back to uh, 7,000. So, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, maybe going even farther back, eight to 10,000 with this year's dig. And that's what we're hoping to, you know, hoping to add on as another chapter, you know, in that archeological story. So once that's all done, you know, now ladies are gonna move in. And, um, you know, I use that, uh, very loosely because, you know, male, female, everybody had their place. Now this thing here, a uh, knife, you know, is what it would be made out of uh, obsidian. And if you've ever cut yourself on a piece of glass, uh, you realize that, you know, obsidian, volcanic glass is actually sharper than a razor blade. So you got these people going up there, butchering, opening up the animals. You have uh, hide going on one way, meat coming down another way, bone over here, and it's all been going down into the processing area. With the hides themselves, you want to be able to uh, scrape the hides, prepare them for for use. You have what's known as a um, as a scraper. So this would be used on the on the outside, on the hair side, and on the inside you'd have something called a flesher. So the flesher itself would then be used, you know, to scrape the inside of the height, the fat, and uh, and all the scrap that you have. With you dig a hole in the ground, you put the um, 
you put the hide with the hair facing outwards, you drop this whole thing into the hole and you fill it up with water. And then once you um, heated up the rocks, you throw the rocks in there and it's, I was, I was amazed by how fast the water boils. Cause I tried it one day with a pitchfork, a propane torch and some rocks. And you know, when I put it in, I thought, well, it's just gonna melt right through the bottom of this five gallon plastic pail. Well, to my amazement, and I'm waiting for the rock to fall out the bottom of the pail, the water starts boiling. So I, I was, you know, that was kind of shocked because, uh, you know, it, it didn't occur to me that after I finished, I went in for a cup of tea and I put my water in a microwave, pushed five minutes, and it took longer to boil my water in a microwave than it did, you know, with the rock out in the, you know, in the boiling pit. So and it boiled for a long time. So in the end, you got all these crushed bones and bits of fat and meat that are in there. You get that fat forming on top. And what they do is that they, once it's coagulated, you take it out and you mix it in with your dried meat, your berries to create pemmican. And once you create that pemmican, you then have the meat that you need to survive the winter. The intestines, very important, but those were eaten, you know, within um, a very short time of the actual hunt. Now with the uh, dried meat itself, you know, if you, a lot of people think, oh, it was 300 buffalo, you got, you know, all this meat, what did you do with it? And you know, some of the questions I get asked, but if you take an animal like uh, Billy, a little bit bigger than what you'd hoped for, females were a little bit smaller, had, you know, they had a higher fat content, so they were preferred. So if you take something like this, you take out all the bone, you take out all the hide, you take out a, all the insides, you dry the meat, you're taking out the water. Put it all back together, you would be lucky if you get about 300 pounds of dried meat. Multiply that by 300 animals, 90,000 pounds. So when you're uh, looking at the population, and we estimate maybe 40, 45,000 people, divide that in, you'd be lucky if you had two pounds of dried meat per person that, you, that had to last all winter. So just because you had a successful hunt, it didn't mean you just sat back and did nothing. You still had to get out there and hunt for your fresh meat every day. Now, what there's a Explorer that came through this area one time in the early days, he went after the bulls like Billy up here, thinking the bigger the animal, uh, less time hunting, more time working. But he soon found out that his men were eating up to 12 pounds of fresh buffalo meat from the bulls. At the end of the day, they were so exhausted they couldn't do any more work. So then they decided to ask the locals, well, how do you eat this thing? And they said, well, you don't, first of all, you don't go after the males, go after the cows, the females. So he found out and writes in his journal that uh, even after eating eight, they had to eat eight pounds of fresh buffalo meat from a cow. But the difference was at the end of the day, they still had energy to do, you know, what, what they intended to do for that day. So it shows you the difference, you know, from today where we have maybe an excess of fat in our meat. Uh, to back then, you know, when you had to literally look for it and, you know, mix it back in. So if you look at today's, uh, you know, for comparison, we all know what a quarter pounder is. I'm not going to talk too much about that. But in two pounds, it's like having eight quarter pounders. So how many of us can really survive a winter, you know, with eight quarter pounders? So you could see why. Hunting was throughout the year using many different uh, forms, you know, was also very important. And, you know, through these stories that we have today and comparisons and so on and so forth, it provides us, you know, with some kind of an understanding and meaning, you know, of what occurred back in those early days. So that's what we do here at Hit Smashing Buffalo Jump. You know, we help connect people to the stories of the, the old ones, as we refer to as the old ones, 
because there is so much that uh, we have to share. So it, it's, uh, I haven't even begun to talk about the ceremonies. I haven't even begun to talk about the dances or even, uh, you know, what we would refer to as parts of those ceremonies that bring us forward. So one of the interesting things that, uh, you know, that we have today is that uh, back in, in this area here, back in 1893, the Northwest Mounted Police came in and uh, or prior to that, and what they noticed were still millions of buffalo here. Well, what they noticed that every year, buffalo make their way south to the winter grounds. Springtime, they come back. And each year, what they noticed was the herds are getting smaller and smaller. And then they record that in 1893, that was it. The buffalo never came back. And those were on a, a, a winter count, you know, from the area. And what's really significant about that was that it also fulfilled the name of the buffalo to refer to Eni. You know, they died, they left. And just recently, I don't know if anybody remembers back in 2012, everybody is saying it was the end of the world and you know, things were happening, but it was also a time of change. And it was also the, the end of the story, which we refer to as Napi and the Rock. So that December 2012, the story of Napi and the Rock fulfilled its time. And then there was a period of four years, quiet. 2016, all of a sudden we had the meeting of the Buffalo Treaty here. First two meetings, very important. First two meetings occurred right here, right where I'm sitting. And on the second meeting, I went to the top of the building and there was five Buffalo that met me at the top door. They had come back. One big male, four, male, four females behind him. So that was an amazing sight. And it was also something that, you know, we have in our stories that tell us that uh, from 2012, 2016 was meant to be quiet. And then things were going to very abruptly change. So 2016, 2019, 2020, we all know what happened. And it began with a big fire to the west of us in the mountains. And then from there, you know, this is where we are today. So where we are is exactly where we're supposed to be. And, you know, for, from there, if you want to see what's going to happen further, come and visit us. We'll share those stories with you. Okay. I'd like to return it back to the moderator. Thank you very much. This was a, a spectacular presentation. Uh, so I guess we are transitioning into the next part of our program. And uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, questions. So please uh, use the chat and uh, or the Q&A if you prefer. So we can pose some questions to, to Stan. All right. I'm receiving a, a few a few comments for you. So thank you, that was wonderful. There we go. Oh, I actually have a few questions popping up uh, in the Q&A. Wow, six questions already. And I anticipate that the number is going to grow very soon. So first one, hi, could you please explain uh, who Napi was? Thank you. Okay, well, like I remember, um, referred to earlier, uh, we have uh, the Genesis, and so back in those days, you know, there was the story of the creation of the old man. And to the east of us here from the Buffalo Jump, uh, there's a lake, which uh, today we just call it Mud Lake. But back in the old days, they would refer to that as the Mud Man Lake. And it goes back, you know, in the story where, you know, the great ones scooped out some mud and made a little ball and breathe the life into it. So the old man came about, and then they said he got lonely. So he was put to sleep, and there was a part of him that was taken out, and then down at Bukaki Lake, or Bukawi Lake, another scoop was taken out. They were mixed all together, 
And, you know, the what they refer to as the mud woman, you know, came out. And they, of course, danced around and had a really good time. And then from there, you know, it's where the seven persons or the seven children, the seven boys came from. Uh, the oldest one, like I mentioned, uh, was Napi. The youngest one is Ukina. And those beings, those original beings, were all, they were all part of a, a family that lived, you know, on, or I would say the original occupants, you know, of the territory that extended over most of the continent. And, um, you know, it talks about how uh, they transformed the land, that they were part of the creation process. And eventually, I guess just like any family, they got into a big argument and squabble and so on and so forth. And um, things, you know, uh, kind of went sideways after that. But the uh, seven brothers, you know, eventually, um, each one of them, I should say, had something that they wore on their hip called a kaispa. And the old man's kaispa is farther to the south of us here, southwest. Today we call it kalispa. It's a kaispa. And they each had medicine, something that we would refer to today as, you know, in that, that bag. So when I told the story about Ukina, I put a finger in there, made a big mark across the land after the fight with the, the old woman, and they're running away. They made this big mark, and then all of a sudden, the Grand Canyon today, as we know it, opened up. It was meant to stop her. So each one of those brothers, you know, had uh, a very big part to play in how the land was transformed. The oldest one, Napi, this was his area. So we have Napi, first jump of Napi here. We have Napi's river. We have Napi's playground to the west of us here. We have where Napi and the crow, you know, uh, or raven, you know, did their thing. Uh, we have Napi and the rock, all those glacial erratics that come through here. A lot of stories around here with Napi, and uh, that's who he was. Thank you very much, Stan. All right, let's move on to the second question. So is there a special significance to your gloves or are they just to make uh, his, uh, he your hands easier to see? That's a really interesting okay. question. Okay, could you repeat the question? I kind of missed sure. that. Is there a special significance to stand gloves or are they just to make uh, his hands easier to see? So what's the significance of your uh, uh, gloves? Oh, my gloves? Yes. Hey. Okay, well, there's, uh, these are this gloves that, I've, uh, that I use with my presentations. And, um, you know, the old time, I, you know, they, they were made with um, elk skin, which, you know, the elk itself uh, is actually a, a lady thing. Elk and, uh, you know, the uh, elk and ladies had this connection. So, like, even the tools, you know, were made out of, it was an elk handle, you see here, and it was a woman's tool. And if you go to north of us here, there's a place called uh, Panoka. And in our language, we would say Panoka. And what it referred to was uh uh, the Red Deer, and there's also a town called Red Deer. So the uh, the the uh, deer the deer skin, which these are made out of, you know, is a, a significance is that they were connected with the male. So even the hides that you have all had meanings. Uh, myself as a hunter, and my name Nina uh, Atsistaumachka refers to a rabbit, and the rabbit itself was called a, um, a hunter's lunch. And it was only eaten by hunters so that if they're traveling out in the land and um, you know they needed a small meal, you know, that's, that was reserved for them. Whereas you have uh, you know, what we call, referred to as bush chicken, uh, keto cakes, you know, they were reserved for the old people. In the old days, somebody gets too tired to go with the herd. They were left behind, the old people. 
and people wouldn't touch the chickens because that was their food, fish. So all these different animals, what we call animals today, we call them beings. You know, we're, we're very special to certain groups of people. And it wasn't just you went out and blanketly did everything, hunted everything. You had to follow protocols. And those are part of the connections between the land, the environment, and also the people. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a, a question about pemigam. So is pemigam still made in the traditional way? Uh, today, we do still have people, you know, that make pemmican. And anytime I get my hands on it, you know, I'll, um, oh, that's, it's a nice tasty meal. Uh, but there was, uh, I was at university one, you know, one year, and we we're supposed to do a presentation there. I was presented uh, with the, the meal, <laughs> the traditional meal, and it was a bag of pemmican about this big. Well, I... You know, I picked it up and being a, a student, university student, I had to do some experiments. I wanted to find out, okay, I got this pouch of pemmican. I want to see how long I could survive on this, you know, with anything else. You know, I had water, I had tea, had my coffee, but I would, every time I got hungry, I would reach in the, that bag of pemmican, put some in my mouth, you know, when I got hungry. And that was all I was eating. It was just a pemmican. Well, to my surprise, I, I almost went a full month without eating, nothing. And at the end of it, I felt really good. I lost weight, you know, and, um, but I was feeling very healthy. I was still able to study. So at that point, you begin to realize there is a lot of energy, you know, that's produced by the pemmican if it's done in a certain way. I recently, you know, heard back in my younger days that the military was experimenting with it, you know, to find out if they could uh, find other ways to use it and to make, make it preserve better. And in the end, after many tries, they said, no, you know, what you see is it's in its perfect condition. You can't improve it. So that's what Pemmican is today. Thank you so much. That's an incredible story. Uh, moving on, uh, and uh, we have another question. So you mentioned obsidian glass uh, earlier. Uh, was obsidian glass uh, uh, hard to find in Alberta? Where was it sourced? Yeah. Could you repeat where? Where was obsidian glass sourced? Oh, was it obs hard to find in Alberta? Well, it, that was, um, see, some people say that, you know, that um, obsidian is very hard to find. But what I say is big chunks of obsidian are very hard to find. Uh, I've gone down to the river and I've walked along many miles. I found a chunk of obsidian, you know, not very big, but the size of the palm of my hand. But if you pick up a handful of sand and you hold it up and you let it shift down like that, you'll see it, all these little black shiny things coming out of it. So I picked out a few of those and I'm looking at it and I was thinking, hmm, there's, that's obsidian. But, it, you know, you can't use it. Uh, so at some point, it must have been here, but once the glaciers come through, it grinds everything right into a powder. So you... Uh, you know, for obsidian to survive that, uh, you're going to have to go some places where, you know, it's coming out of the ground fresh and you have sources, you know, down in uh, Idaho, Oregon, you know, where uh, that's where the archaeologists have traced the origin of the obsidian that's found here to those locations. We do have a quarry to the west of us, about 50 miles west of us, where they did uh, mine, uh, what we would call uh, flint or chert, and it's sort of a yellowish brown color, and there's holes all over the place, and if you go up there, you can find, uh, you know, where they were uh, taking only the very best material, and the rest of it still all up there, but 
the most important one, uh, the most important uh, 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 stone that they were using was, was the quartzite. And for me, I've been working with quartzite for a number of years, and I still haven't found the secret of how they're able to shape it. I've seen axes made where the handle actually goes right through the middle of the um, quartzite. I've seen masks that were made where the inside of the mask is hollowed right out. And, um, you know, I still haven't figured out the technique or how they do it. You know, I could do that using diamond bits and a Dremel, but uh, how they did it back in those days without modern tools, you know, completely escapes my, my knowledge. Again, thank you so much, Stan. And I have a more uh, of a comment coming for you. So, uh, for you. So, one is a thank you. Another person is saying thank you. That was wonderful. And uh, I have a few more questions before we wrap up the session. So, will there be a repeat of this session? It was great. Uh, I don't think that we're going to have a, a repeat, but we're going to have uh, um, recordings available very soon. So please keep an eye on the Royal Alberta Museum website and uh, we're going to post uh, um, the recording of this session uh, possibly next week. So very soon. I hope that this uh, uh, responds to this question. I have uh, another question popping up. So hello. Is there any evidence that shows that hunting buffaloes with the, with the buffalo jump strategy became harder over time because somehow buffaloes learned how to avoid the cliff? Okay, well, that uh, goes back to some of the stories that we had, you know, with the buffalo hunt where they talked about you could not allow any animals to escape. Because if you did, the ones that escaped would go back to the herd and tell them, don't go up there. And so, you know, when the animals went over the cliff, you wanted to make sure you had people out there so that if the injured ones are going to run away, you have to take them down. Because, uh, you know, once they've come over, they've learned, you know, what's waiting down there. And, you know, if you... If they get back into the herd, the chances of a successful hunt are also going to diminish. But in addition to the hunt, is that when the archaeologists, you know, excavated beneath the cliff, you have about uh, 10 meters of cliff that's sticking out. And then from under the ground, you can actually go down about another 22 meters. And uh, they find artifacts and bone all the way down. So what it's telling us is that over time, you know, the uh, buffalo jump has constantly changed. And the erosion, uh, the uh, mass wasting, the slumpage that's taking place is uh, actually only goes back 6,000 years. So that's what uh, this crew is doing right now is that they're trying to penetrate, you know, that uh, 6,000 because that 6,000 you know, once you're digging in that material, that's it. You're not going back 6,000 years. But what it tells us is that, yeah, it filled up. So towards the end uh, of its lifetime, the cliff itself was, um, you know, getting much more dangerous because more uh, buffalo would be surviving the actual drum. The original one was very lethal. And, uh, you know, when they did stop it, it was probably a good time to stop because, uh, you know, the, it was probably getting too dangerous at that point. Again, thank you so much, Stan. And I have a few more questions again. So one of the visitors is saying thank you, first of all. And then here's the question. Are the public able to observe the archeological excavations? How long is the season excavation? Okay, last year we went uh, what the University of Lethbridge referred to as uh, semester one, on, on semester two. And um, last year we had a lot of smoke up in this area here and it was extremely hot. It was, uh, 
normally out, you know, right below the parking lot, it was about 40. So I would say in the pits, must have been closer to temperature of Death Valley, you know, up around 50s. And a lot of times, you know, they dug until they drunk. So this year they decided to move it into the first semester. And um, hopefully by the time they get into the hotter weeks that are coming up very soon, that they will have accomplished most, you know, of what they set out to do. But in addition to that, you know, during the last part of the first dig last year, they uncovered some, you know, very interesting artifacts. And um, so what they are hoping to do is if they run into the same situation this year, because they're in semester one, uh, they might be able to continue on a reduced basis into semester two. So the public, um, you know, is welcome to come out and talk to them. And uh, not, a, not only that, but we also have the Archaeology Society out of Lethbridge, uh, which are, um, you know, they're average citizens that are up here volunteering as well. So, you know, if you have any problems, you could maybe take out a membership with them you know, let them look at your, let them get used to who you are and what, you know, what you do. And if they feel comfortable, they might just invite you in. So that's, you know, arrangements that with the society and with the university that they would have to consider. Because uh, one of the big things that we're still in is this thing called um, the bubble. Everybody heard of the bubble? Well, there's some, uh, you know, there's some factors involved with there where they still have to maintain a certain amount of distance between people. And the group down here, they don't go anywhere uh, outside of, you know, that little bubble that they've created. And uh, I have a few uh, comments for you. So wonderful presentation, the best I ever heard over the years. Thank you so much. More, uh, more feedback, thanks for the presentation. It was really informative. I'll definitely go to visit Ad Smash Dean Buffalo Jump this summer. That's fantastic. I'm really glad to see that we, uh, we really inspired people uh, to learn more. And uh, let me see, oh, okay. Who is leading the excavation? That's a, a question. Well, we're very lucky that we um, have Bob. He's from uh, the Royal Alberta Museum. It's always nice to have him down here during training. Uh, we have um, Sean Bubel. She's uh, with the University of Lethbridge, the head archaeologist down there. And we have uh, Kevin, uh, who's, um, you know, works with Sean. And uh, they were very instrumental, in instrumental in helping us with our summer staff training uh, for the guides and the interpreters. So we do all work together as close as we can. And uh, a lot of information that we have, we exchange. So it's a very unique situation, especially with the University of Lethbridge, since the archeology span department is actually under geography, uh, whereas in most universities, it's under your anthropology. So, you know, the geography background really helps our situation here. Okay, I have a, a new feedback for you. So thank you very much. Espe I especially enjoyed hearing the traditional stories and how they are tied to the landscape. I agree, they were absolutely amazing. And uh, uh, a new question for you. I'd like to know what Stan thinks about the food pit from a head smashed in being removed to the ram. Seems to me that it is something that should be kept in the interpretive center at head smashed in. That's a pretty well, interesting one. Yes, uh, the, the practice of archaeology, you know, in the past has, to be, has been to remove items, you know, and take them away. The problem with Hit Smashed In right now is that uh, it is an interpretive center. It's not a museum. And as a result of that, uh, what you have is that we, we have we do not have uh, climate control. We do not have security. 
uh, all the um, storage artifact and all the storage space that, that's required. So therefore any um, artifacts that we find you know, are clean, they're studied, they're moved up to uh, RAM, which has all the facilities. And then what happens is that those items are then returned, you know, on a, on a basis. Now, where archaeology is going with uh, this excavation is that we do, and we did have people that thought it was uh, not appropriate, you know, to take, mater take materials out, excavate them, remove them, and then that was it. So what this team is doing now and, you know, and considering uh, and exploring ways of anything that's excavated, you know, to goes back into the ground and, you know, it's left there for uh, future use. Once all the study, uh, studyable material or angles, you know, have been taken from it and then, Next generation have something that's, you know, the, that'll be marked uh, so that they'll know that it's not part, you know, of the original archaeological materials that uh, were in there in the beginning, that they'll at least be there in some way or some form. So we're hoping that will become the new type of archaeology to come from, you know, this particular site. All right, I'm monitoring the chat for more comments or questions. It doesn't look like we have a, a new, new question, so I guess we are uh, wrapping up this session. So I just want to say thank you, Stan, for sharing your uh, knowledge uh, and experiences uh, and your traditional stories. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, I also wanted to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, before we say goodbye, I just, want, I just have a few things uh, to share. So uh, I wanted to remind you that June is a, a Indigenous History Month. We celebrate the heritage, diversity, and strength of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And uh, I would like to invite you again to check out Smash Dean Buffalo Jumps website and discover their amazing programs, experiences, and events. Uh, I shared the, the link for Head Smash Dean Buffalo Jump uh, in the chat, so that should be available to everyone. And uh, I'm also sharing a couple of links uh, uh, from the Royal Alberta Museum, because please make sure to check our website as well. We have uh, prepared a list of uh, Indigenous history resources. And we also have uh, a new stunning uh, video session about uh, Indigenous uh, art history that is available on our website. So there you go. You have uh, all the relevant links in the chat. I also wanted to let you know that a quick program survey is available at the end of this talk because we want to hear from you. Your input is extremely important and we would like to ask you what kind of programs and experiences you would like to see in the future. So both in person or uh, you know, virtually. Um, the survey will open automatically in your browser at the end of the talk. Uh, the data will be collected anonymously, of course. And if you do not want to participate in the survey, that's totally fine. Just close your browser. Uh, one last thing. Up Close is coming to an end for this year, and our last talk is on June 17. In this talk that is called Piecing Together the Puzzle of Past Landscapes, we're going to learn how the landscape, forest, and climate have changed over millennia, and how do we know that? So book your spot today, make sure you're not skipping that last talk. Uh, again, thank you, Stan, and thank you, everyone, for attending uh, Up Close Stories, Objects, and Ideas from Beyond the Galleries. I hope to see you at our next talk. Take care, everyone.